Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton. Welcome to the beautiful woods of Pennsylvania. The final weeks of autumn are here, and even though temperatures are cooling down quite a bit, ticks are still active in these woods. If I walk through some of the brushier areas, there's a good chance that at least a few ticks will latch onto my clothes. In a previous video, I discussed my strategy for dealing with ticks, and that involves practicing awareness, maneuvering skillfully through wild landscapes, wearing lighter colored clothing, inspecting my body during and after my adventures, and eating an immunosupportive diet that protects against tick-borne illnesses. That's an individualized strategy, meaning it works at the individual level. And for the rest of this video, I want to talk about tick control strategies at the landscape level. This is a topic ecologists have been studying for quite some time. How can we reduce the presence of ticks across vast acreages of land and subsequently reduce the incidences of tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease and anaplasmosis? Is it even possible to achieve such a feat? These are all good questions, and let's start by addressing some approaches to reducing tick populations that you might have heard of. Removing non-native shrubs like Japanese barberry, calling deer, letting chickens and guinea fowl roam your property, and using acaricides or pesticides that kill ticks. Because these strategies are somewhat well-known and occasionally to frequently implemented, I want to focus instead on another strategy. It's a rather novel strategy that some ecologists are studying. The use of earthworms. Yes, earthworms. Those segmented, wriggly creatures that we often find in the soil, under logs, and, of course, in bait shops. Now, how on earth could earthworms reduce tick populations? Do they eat ticks? Do they repel ticks? Well, to answer those questions, it's important to briefly address the biology and ecology of both groups of organisms. There are many tick species. Let's focus our attention on the ones I encounter most frequently. Deer ticks, also known as black-legged ticks. The life cycle of a deer tick typically takes two years to complete, and it involves four stages. Egg, larva, nymph, and adult. After the eggs hatch, ticks require blood meals to move through the life cycle. Deer ticks receive their blood meals from many animals, including birds, lizards, and mammals. White-footed mice are important hosts for larvae and nymphs. White-tailed deer are important hosts for adults. Now, a major cause of tick mortality is desiccation. This is why ticks spend a lot of time in soil and leaf litter where moisture levels are high. When ticks crawl out of the moist leaf litter and climb vegetation, they put themselves at risk of desiccation in exchange for the potential reward of finding a host. Ticks are also susceptible to low temperatures, particularly freezing temperatures. This is why ticks overwinter in leaf litter. The dense litter and additional snow cover provide adequate insulation and protect against desiccation. So leaf litter is important, but it's worth noting that the value of leaf litter to ticks may be a bit less pronounced in closed canopied forests where temperature and humidity levels are moderated by dense shade. Earthworms, on the other hand, are quite unlike ticks. Earthworms are annelids that share relations with leeches. Thousands of earthworm species exist, and interestingly, the vast majority of earthworms that exist in the northeastern United States and Canada are non-native earthworms. The recent ice age and its accompanying ice sheets eliminated nearly every native earthworm species from this broad region. Now, it's no secret that gardeners love earthworms. Earthworm castings enhance microbial activity within soils, making nutrients more available to some plants. Earthworm burrows create passages for air, water, and roots. Earthworms play important roles in the decomposition of organic material, to the point where many non-native earthworms, according to researchers, heavily reduce the amount of organic litter not just in yards and in gardens, but in forests. And here is where our connection between earthworms and ticks is made. Many earthworm species effectively remove a preferred microhabitat of ticks, and that preferred microhabitat is leaf litter. 
Now, it's one thing to casually assume that the presence of earthworms might be associated with a reduction in ticks due to the removal of leaf litter. But is it actually true? Have any studies detected a relationship between earthworm activity and tick abundance? Well, researchers in northern Wisconsin found that greater earthworm activity was associated with fewer nymphal ticks. Researchers in central New York discovered that the presence of earthworms decreased the density of nymphal deer ticks by 46.1% and larval ticks by 29.3%. John Warren Reynolds, a renowned earthworm expert, suggested that earthworms could possibly reduce the spread of tick-borne diseases by removing the litter layer essential for the overwintering nymphal stage. Of course, this all makes sense. Ticks love leaf litter. Some earthworm species rapidly decompose leaf litter. The removal of leaf litter by any means exposes ticks to desiccation. But you might be wondering, how feasible is this strategy, especially on a large scale? Do we just dump a bunch of earthworms from the local bait shop into the woods, wait a couple of years, and expect ticks to disappear? Well, as I mentioned earlier, nearly all the earthworm species that currently exist in areas that were formerly glaciated in North America are non-native intentionally releasing even more non-native earthworms into these formerly glaciated landscapes might actually not be the wisest strategy, at least according to ecologists, who consider non-native earthworms powerful ecosystem engineers that profoundly change landscapes by modifying soil structure, redistributing organic matter, and altering the habitat of other organisms living in or on the soil. In other words, non-native earthworms do a lot of things that, according to researchers, cause myriad ecologically destructive changes to natural environments. For this reason, a tick reduction strategy using massive quantities of earthworms in certain regions of North America probably won't be implemented on a large scale anytime soon. But ecologists will likely continue to study the relationship between the two groups of organisms, especially if tick-borne diseases among humans increase, and especially if other tick reduction measures fail. But not all other measures fail. In fact, some measures show very promising results. We already established the fact that because desiccation is a major cause of tick mortality, ticks spend a lot of time in moisture-rich leaf litter. And the reduction in the amount of leaf litter through the feeding activities of earthworms could potentially reduce tick populations. But what if earthworms aren't necessary? What if we could achieve the goal of altering the microhabitats of ticks in tick-prone landscapes without the use of earthworms? How would we do that? With rakes? Probably not effective on a large scale. Leaf blowers? I wouldn't recommend them. How about using a tool that's been implemented by humans not just for decades or centuries, but for millennia, a tool that could not only reduce tick populations, but enhance the quality of certain landscapes. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But it's actually not. What we're talking about is fire. Not wildfire necessarily, but prescribed fire used very intentionally and strategically by humans. As it turns out, ecologists believe that a major factor contributing to the large number of tick-borne diseases is believe it or not, forest change due to the decline of fire frequency and the conversion of burned xeric forests to fire-excluded mesic forests. Xeric is just a fancy word referring to dry conditions. Mesic, or mesic, refers to moderately moist conditions. At the time of European settlement in eastern North America, many forests were open forests, more like woodlands and savannas, with large trees that were widely spaced apart growing among herbaceous rich understories. A key reason these woodlands and savannas were open was that they were burned periodically by humans and by lightning. Burning practices continued intentionally and unintentionally through the early 1900s, but largely stopped in the first half of the 20th century. A major result of fire suppression in eastern North America was that open forests that were formerly dominated by fire-adapted oaks, pines, and hickories became thickly stocked, closed, canopied forests dominated by fire-sensitive species like maples and tulip trees. 
This conversion from dry, xeric, fire-dependent conditions to moist, mesic, fire-sensitive conditions is known as mesification or mesification. And according to ecologists, mesification favors ticks, it favors their hosts, and it favors tick-borne illnesses. Is it possible then that the reintroduction of fire, particularly to landscapes that were once fire dependent, could actually reduce tick populations? Well, absolutely. It's certainly not a novel strategy. Accounts discussing practices from the 1700s report that tick reduction was achieved through the use of setting fire to fallen leaves. In more recent years, many studies have found that prescribed fire has been successful at reducing ticks of the eastern United States. And the mechanism makes sense. Fire directly kills ticks. Fire consumes leaf litter and the vegetation that ticks climb. Fire can open up the canopy and support drier conditions within the forest. Fire favors predators of ticks like northern bobwhite. Fire can decrease the abundance of some small mammal hosts. But not all fire is equally effective for reducing tick populations. Small scale, one time burns, according to the research, might not work. And they could actually lead to an increase in the number of ticks due to an increase in the abundance of hosts that thrive in early successional habitats. But regular long term prescribed fires create drier microclimates at ground level and achieve sustained tick reductions and therefore lower encounter rates of infected ticks, which can lead to a reduction in the number of humans infected with Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. And of course, regular long-term prescribed fires also have the potential, when used in conjunction with selective cutting, to inhibit or reverse mesification and restore fire-dependent ecosystems which many ecologists believe is a very good thing. Yes, there are limitations to this method. No method is perfect, fire included. But compared to using earthworms, prescribed fire appears to be a much more effective way to deal with ticks in certain ecosystems, particularly because its benefits seem to outweigh the risks when conducted properly. Now, it's almost certainly unlikely that, even with fire, humans will ever be able to completely remove ticks from wild ecosystems. These blood-sucking parasites, and I say that with respect, are here to stay for a while, and I think that's okay. I don't think an achievable goal is the complete removal of ticks from every tick-infested landscape on Earth, nor should we obsess over the matter too much. If we truly believe that certain ecosystems are out of balance due to increasing tick populations, there are things we can do at the individual level, there are things we can do at the landscape level. The question is, will we actually do them? Thank you so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. If you'd like to support this channel, please subscribe and head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter so that we can stay in touch. Thanks again for watching. I will see you on the next video.